The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Hello and welcome back to Element 14 Presents. I'm Andy Weston and in this episode we'll be modifying a Super Scope to make it work with modern televisions. The Super Scope is a light gun accessory for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System that relies on CRT technology for hit detection. It has a sensor that detects light from the TV, and it transmits data to an infrared receiver connected to a controller port on the game console. Unfortunately, modern flat panel displays are not compatible with a Super Scope, which means that if you happen to find one of these plastic bazookas in your attic or at a garage sale somewhere, you'll have to get an old TV to play it on, or it's not going to work. They're not making CRTs anymore, and existing ones aren't going to last forever, so we're going to upgrade the Super Scope's tracking system with a Raspberry Pi, an Arduino, and an infrared video camera. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. Inspired designs. Each week, Element 14 Presents brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. The Super Scope tracks a player's aim with the help of four separate components. The light gun, the infrared receiver, the game console, and a CRT television. Unlike LCD or OLED displays, which show an image all at once, CRTs draw from left to right and top to bottom. And really, only one small spot on the screen is brightly illuminated at any given moment. When the Super Scope is aimed at the point that's being drawn currently, then the photo sensor in the gun picks up the light and sends an infrared signal to the receiver. The receiver then tells the SNES that light was detected, and the game, which knows what screen coordinates it's currently drawing, also knows that the gun is aiming at that point. So the aim is worked out by the timing of the signal sent by the Super Scope, and without a CRT drawing its image line by line, there's nothing to produce that timing. So here's my idea. First we'll turn on the infrared LEDs in the front of the gun continuously. Then we'll put small squares of infrared reflective tape on the corners of the TV that bounce the light back to the gun. That way we can avoid having to use a powered sensor bar. Inside the gun we'll place an infrared video camera that can see the reflective markers that we put on the TV. A Raspberry Pi will process the video in real time and calculate the XY coordinates that we're aiming at. Instead of the infrared receiver, we'll send the coordinates to an Arduino with a Bluetooth module. We'll also feed the composite video signal from the SNES into the Arduino. We'll use the coordinates that we got from the Super Scope, along with the composite and vertical sync, to precisely time the signal sent to the console via the controller port. Now that's a lot of information to take in all at once, but we're going to build the project step by step, and I'm going to explain everything in detail as we go. The Super Scope has infrared LEDs that send encoded information about what buttons are being pressed and whether or not the photo sensor is picking up light. These ones are almost 30 years old, and I don't know what their specifications are, so I'm going to replace this board with a simpler one, along with some new LEDs, and that way I'll know the wavelength, forward voltage, and forward current. I'm using this Bakelite Perf board, which is great for prototyping, because you can cut it with regular scissors. I've traced the original board to get the shape as accurate as possible. I'm going to wire the LEDs in series with a current limiting resistor, and to determine the resistor value I'm going to cheat and use an online wizard. This one can even generate a wiring diagram. Ok, here's the new board. The LEDs are spaced identically to the original, so we can continue to use this plastic cap, and I've wired it with a screw terminal type connector that lets me easily plug in a power supply for testing. I'm really happy with how this turned out, it fits perfectly. We can't very well test the LEDs with our eyes, so we'll use the Pi No IR camera, which is the same as the regular Pi camera, but without the usual filter that blocks infrared light. However, we want to see only infrared light, so I'm going to add another type of filter that blocks visible light and passes through infrared. I'm going to use a polyester filter so I can cut it to the right size later on. After plugging in the camera, we can preview its output with a tiny Python program. Now let's check how well the reflective tape works. The hexagonal pattern suggests that it's retroreflective, which means it reflects light back to its source regardless of the angle. For testing, I'll just place it here in the corner of my monitor. Alright, so it appears that we have a problem. The tape works okay, but my real concern is that it's not the only thing reflecting infrared. I'm getting a lot of glare straight off the monitor, and that's going to seriously complicate my video processing algorithm. I think I need to come up with a new plan. I really liked the idea of not having to use a light bar, but it didn't work out in practice, so we'll just go ahead and use LEDs on the TV itself. We'll put one LED on each corner, just like we did with the tape, and that will simplify our tracking software even more. Over in Blender, I've designed an LED holder, and we'll print four of them in black PLA. We 
You can power these off USB since most TVs have USB ports available. I've wired it up on some protoboard and put it in this plastic enclosure that snaps shut. Velcro dots provide a removable mounting solution. It's slightly obtrusive, but I'm confident that we're going to get better results than we did with the tape. Here's the infrared camera test. Wow, yeah, that's pretty much perfect. The SuperScope has a magnifying lens that projects light from a CRT onto a sensor. We don't need that lens, and in fact, this is the perfect place to mount our camera. We've got this one inch plastic square to keep dirt out and prevent people from poking the lens with their finger. Then we've got this IR passing filter, and finally the camera. So I guess we'll print this in two parts and create a kind of sandwich with the clear plastic and filter inside. And we'll print a couple of posts on the back so we can stick the camera on there. Everything fits just like it should. I'm going to use a little hot glue and press these together. And look at that, the camera just pops right on. There's room in the back of the case for the Raspberry Pi, so we'll need a long cable for the camera. I think 50 centimeters should be enough. Finally, we've secured the camera in place with some more hot glue so it doesn't rotate and give us a crooked image. We've got more work to do on the gun, but right now I want to shift focus to the receiver. This infrared receiver gets data from the SuperScope and sends signals to the SNES through the controller port. Our newly designed receiver will be powered by an Arduino, and one of its jobs will be to process composite video coming from the console. We don't actually care about the video itself, only the horizontal and vertical sync, which will allow us to communicate with the SNES in a properly timed manner. The Arduino isn't fast enough to handle this directly, in addition to all the other tasks we needed to perform. So we're going to use an LM1881 sync separator chip. Let's throw this on a breadboard and build the example circuit shown in the datasheet. I've split the video signal so we can view and process it simultaneously. This Arduino code counts the lines in a single frame. Most NES games have a resolution of 256 by 224, so these numbers are very close. I'd call that a success. Want to build the project in this episode? Want to download the code? Find the parts list? Want to ask a specific question and know this host will answer it? Simply take out your phone and point your camera at this QR code. This will take you right to all the details you need to get started. We'll see you on the Element 14 community. The receiver connects to the second controller port on the Super NES. It uses a shift register to send multiple data bits on a single data pin. Since we're replacing the IR receiver anyway, I'm going to reuse the controller cable and remove the shift register from the circuit board. Again, using the breadboard, I've wired everything up to the Arduino. And here's a bit of code that'll let us simulate the super scope by typing at the serial monitor. I'm guessing at the best numbers to aim at the center of the screen. 120 is half the vertical resolution of 240, so that works fine for the vertical aim. The composite sync triggers an interrupt so we can increment the line number, and when we reach 120, we know we're about halfway down the screen. But there's no signal that corresponds to an individual pixel. An NTSC scan line lasts for about 64 microseconds, and horizontal retrace is around 10 microseconds. So if we take 64 minus 10 and divide by two, we get 27. Inside our composite sync interrupt handler, we delay 27 microseconds, then we set the data line low, wait for another five microseconds, and set the data line high again. In every SuperScope game, there's a calibration screen that lets you test your aim. I've got this set up so when we press T, it sets the trigger line low, and after a quarter of a second, sets it high again, like pressing and releasing the trigger. Let's try it. Nice. So the fact that it shows up right in the middle doesn't mean a whole lot. It always does that when you're calibrating. It's the next shot that'll tell us if we're getting consistent timing. <laughs> hey, it works. So now we'll use the W, A, S, and D keys to change the scan line and delay values, which should have the effect of nudging the aim in different directions. 
Let's try aiming to the left. <laughs> yes, we've now got the Arduino pretending to be the super scope and receiver, and by adjusting values, we can aim wherever we want. This is an HC06 Bluetooth module, and we're going to configure it to receive data from the Raspberry Pi, which has Bluetooth built in. The module uses serial communication, so after wiring it up, we'll create an Arduino sketch using software serial. This offers port flexibility and allows us to continue using the serial monitor to issue commands. The HC06 supports AT commands, and we can use them to set the password and device name, for example. For convenience, I'm going to test pairing this up in Windows. The module appears as a serial port, so we can use the free tool PuTTY to open a session and send data back and forth. Pairing with the Raspberry Pi is far more complicated. You can find detailed step-by-step -step instructions at the Element 14 community website. Fortunately, you only need to do this once. After that, our code will be able to open a connection to the module by itself. So we've got our LEDs, we've got our camera and Raspberry Pi mounted, video sync signal processing is working, and Bluetooth communication was a success. I think if we work on the like on buttons next, it'll help tie things together. There are three buttons and one three position switch wired to this board, but honestly we don't need any of these other components. We need the board because it provides structure, so I think the simplest solution here is to remove everything. Alright, I'm back, and you can see that all those extra components are now gone. We're going to use five GPIO pins on the Pi. So if we take a look at the back, we've got five wires connected to one leg of a button or switch. The other legs will be connected together and tied to 3.3 volts with a current limiting resistor. And we'll need a wire for that as well for a total of six. I've also isolated the switches by cutting some of the traces, and this is achieved by carefully scratching the copper off with a screwdriver. On the software side of things, you can see we're using the Pi's internal pull-down resistors, and the Python code here is pretty self-explanatory. Every half a second we display button statuses, and if a button is pressed, we print true. Let's see if it works. Awesome! Notice how the first two lines are actually the turbo and power on states of the power switch. Whenever turbo is true, power on must also be true. At this point we're wrapping things up hardware-wise. We'll start migrating our circuits off the breadboard. I discovered that you can get protoboards specifically for the Arduino so that you can make your own shield. Here it is before. And this is after. It's a lot more compact, but it needs an enclosure. I tried to make this fit in the original infrared receiver case, but for some reason the plastic they use in these is super brittle after 30 years. It's just disintegrating. There's plenty of Arduino cases out there that you can just 3D print, so that's what I've done. This is a model I found online and modified slightly with holes for the cables. I just ran some thermal tests, and even with heat sinks, the Pi CPU is getting really close to 80 degrees C, which is where it starts throttling, so I'm going to add some active cooling. I've got this Pi fan which fits perfectly in the battery compartment, and I've designed and 3D printed this shroud to protect it. Now the idea is to have air flowing across the parts, so I'll drill some holes in the top of the case, and hopefully the fan will draw air in and across the chips and then blow it out at the bottom. You can see I've marked roughly where I want the holes to be. I'm going to redo this to fix the spacing, and then I'm going to use this little hand drill to actually drill the holes. And there it is! I think that's satisfactory, considering that I just eyeballed it. What matters is whether or not it brings the CPU temperature down. Okay, so I ran some stress tests. Without the fan, I'm getting 77 degrees. And with the fan, it stabilizes around 67 degrees. So this is definitely worth it in my opinion. One thing that bothered me about the original SuperScope is that there's no power indicator. That's a problem now that we're using a Raspberry Pi, because we can't just cut the power without the risk of corrupting the SD card. There's this trick where you can wire an LED to the transmit pin, and it'll work to show the power status if you enable the serial port. Finally, let's add some ports for power and an external display. I'm just going to be plugging this into the wall, but it is USB-C and you could use a battery pack as long as it outputs at least 2.5 amps. I've got a couple of short extension cables that will route to the outside of the case. That worked out really well. I used some moldable glue to fill in the gaps in the end. It's time to look at the tracking software. Rather than reinvent the wheel, we're using OpenCV, which is a real-time computer vision library. I'm building from source rather than installing it with a package manager, which takes a lot longer, but this way we can optimize for the Pi. Getting into the code at a high level, we've got a Python script that runs when the Pi is turned on. This grabs video frames in a continuous loop until the power switch is set to off and a shutdown command is executed. 
Inside the loop, we use OpenCV to convert the current frame to gray, and then black and white based on a threshold brightness value. Then we call this magical method called Fine Contours, which detects the LEDs in the frame, and then we filter out contours below a certain size. We draw a green dot to indicate each LED, and a red dot to indicate the center of the screen. If we plug a monitor into the HDMI port on the SuperScope, we can use these graphics for debugging. If we have exactly four points, we create a perspective transform that takes the points and maps them onto a rectangle whose dimensions match our tracking resolution. That way we can stand off to the side, or even rotate the SuperScope, and it'll still work. Finally, we apply the perspective transform to the coordinates at the center of the screen, and this should give us the location that we're aiming at. Then we encode and transmit the coordinates via Bluetooth using an extremely simple protocol. This is so cool. There's a little bit of lag, but I don't think it'll be a problem. It's just about time to play some games. I'm really pleased with this. With the exception of the power cord, it's not immediately obvious that it's been modified. Okay, I'm gonna take it upstairs and try a few different games and see how well it works. The first game I'm testing is Super Scope 6, which was bundled with the Super Scope when it was new. I played this a little bit before modding the hardware and it feels exactly the same as before. The accuracy is good enough to take out the smaller missiles in level five, but in level six, they were too small and I lost the game. I played just about as well here as I did on the CRT version, so the lag isn't really affecting playability. Next up is Yoshi Safari, and I have to say, I am just terrible at this game. Uh, at first I thought there was a problem with the turbo feature, but I think I'm just bad at it. Anyway, from what I can tell, it seems to work, and the cursor button makes you jump just like it's supposed to, so at least I got to test out all the buttons. Finally, we've got Battle Clash. I made it through the first level once I realized you have to charge your weapon, but I couldn't get past level 2. I think this is due to my lack of skill more than anything. I only tried a couple times because at this point the gun was getting really uncomfortable to hold. I think I'm starting to understand why this thing wasn't more popular. That's all we have for today. Have you ever modified or upgraded an old device to make it compatible with current technology? Let us know on the Element 14 community at element14.com presents, and we'll see you next time.